measures of central tendency and here are the different measures of central tendency that we will talk about the arithmetic mean is the simplest measure of central tendency and we arrive at the arithmetic mean by adding all the observations and then dividing by the number of observations the arithmetic mean for a population is generally denoted by the greek symbol mu and this is your summation sign so if you have n observations you say i goes from 1 to n and essentially you are summing up all the observations over here and then dividing by the number of observations a sample mean is generally denoted by x bar and here again the method is exactly the same you go from 1 to n so you sum up all the observations in the sample and then divide by the number of observations in the sample the median is the middle item of a set of items that has been sorted into ascending order let's say you have these numbers which have already been sorted in ascending order the median is the middle number if you have a odd number then this is straightforward if you have an even number of items then you take the middle two numbers which in this case would be 9 and 10 and you simply then take the average of the middle two numbers note that the median is less affected by extreme values than the mean to give you a simple example if you have these numbers 7 8 and 20 and this looks like a extreme value the median over here is going to be 8 it is not overly impacted by the 20 if you have lots of outliers then obviously the median can be impacted but in this example 20 is not impacting the median but 20 will have a major impact on the mean because the mean over here is going to be 7 plus 8 plus 20 divided by 3 so because of this 20 the mean number or the average number will go up a lot the mode is simply the most frequently occurring value in a distribution in this simple set the mode is 8 we can sometimes have data sets with more than one mode they are called bimodal if they are two modes or trimodal if there are three modes it is also possible that a data set might not have any mode let's talk about a few other concepts of mean starting with the weighted mean in a weighted mean different observations are given different proportional influence on the mean let's consider the following situation you have invested in three stocks and here is the amount that you've invested over the year the returns were as follows five percent on a seven percent on b and nine percent on c and the question is what was your portfolio return if you simply take the mean of five seven and nine you would get an answer of seven percent but is that really an indication of how your portfolio has performed the answer is it is not because clearly a higher weightage of your portfolio is in stock c therefore the return on stock c should have a larger bearing on the mean compared to the return on stock a so how do we do that essentially we do the following we figure out the weightage of each stock so the weightage of stock a is 40 divided by the total portfolio which is 200 million so a's weightage is 40 over 200 and then this needs to be multiplied by the return on a which is five percent plus the weightage of stock b which is 60 over 200 multiplied by the return on b which is seven percent plus the weightage of c which is 100 over 200 multiplied by nine percent and then you simply solve this 
to get your weighted average and intuitively you should be able to tell that the weighted mean or the weighted average should be greater than 7% because of the higher influence of stock C which has the greatest weightage of the three stocks. If you do the calculation you should get 7.6% and again notice that the highest weightage of 0.5 comes from stock C. Now a relatively straightforward point that you might not have thought about is that with your regular mean each observation is given the same weightage. So what we do with the regular mean is say 5 plus 7 plus 9 divided by 3 which is essentially the same as saying 1 third into 5 plus 1 third into 7 plus 1 third into 9. So 1 over n is the weightage given to all three items and that clearly does not make sense in this situation. And just to emphasize the point, with a weighted mean, we put a weightage that is more relevant given the problem that we are solving. Now you need to try and solve this problem to make sure you understand how to calculate the weighted mean. This is the calculation and the answer should be 2.44%. Let's now talk about the geometric mean and we have seen this briefly in the previous reading also. Mathematically, the geometric mean of n numbers is simply a product of the n numbers raised to the power of 1 over n. So if you have three numbers 7, 8 and 9, the geometric mean would be 7 times 8 times 9 raised to the power of 1 over 3, 3 because we have three numbers. The geometric mean is frequently used to average rates of change over time or to compute growth rate of a variable. If you think about it, interest rate tells us about the rate of change of money over time. So very often to compute your average interest rate over a given year we use the geometric mean and that is what we did when we computed the time weighted rate of return in the previous reading. Let us look at a simple example. An investment account had returns of 20%, 20% and minus 40% over the last three years. What is the arithmetic mean and then what is the geometric mean? I am asking you to calculate the arithmetic mean first just to illustrate a point. If you calculate the arithmetic mean, you, you will have 20 plus 20 minus 40 divided by 0. So you will simply get an arithmetic mean of 0. But is that really what is happening? If you think about it, let's say you invest $100. At the end of one year, this will become 120. At the end of two years, that becomes 144 and then we have a minus 40% return in the 30 year and we end up with only 86.4. So effectively we have gone from 100 down to 86.4. So clearly every year the return is negative. On average how much did we lose every year? That is what the geometric mean will tell us. And the way we solve this is we look at the return for the first year, which is 20%. So we put in 1 plus 20% or 1 plus 0.2, which is 1.2, multiplied by again this 20% return over here. So we write 1.2 times 0 0.6 raised to the power of 1 over 3. And this should give us. 0 0.9524. The interpretation is that for every year on average one dollar is going down to 0.9524 dollars and if you subtract one that means that your return on average for every year is minus 0 0.0476 
which is the same as minus 4.76 percent so this is a geometric mean return if you look at the formula here is what we've done and again this should be exactly the same as what you saw earlier with time weighted rate of return 1 plus r1 which is 1 plus the return for the first year times 1 plus r2 and here we only have three years so 1 plus the return in the third year which is minus 0 0.4 and that in our calculation or in our example is 0.6 raised to the power of 1 over n which is 1 over 3 minus 1 that gives us this number now to understand this point notice that if you start with a hundred dollars and then every year if you are to lose 4.76 percent so you lose 4.76 percent in the first year lose 4.76 percent in the second year lose 4.76 in the third year then you will end up with 86.4 so the interpretation of the geometric mean is that it is telling you on average how much you are losing every year to make sure you understand this concept well do this problem now you should calculate the return for the first year the second year and then simply come up with the geometric mean 0.5 simply is 1 over 2 because we have two periods we minus 1 to come up with the return you should get 0.1832 which is 18.32 percent next we talk about the harmonic mean the harmonic mean is a special type of weighted mean in which the observations weight is inversely proportional to its magnitude this might be a little difficult to understand but let's look at an example and after the example it will make sense let's say you purchase two thousand dollars worth of your company stock every month the purchase price over the last three months has been 20 24 and 30 on average how much did you pay per share now the average amount that you pay per share is actually the harmonic mean let us just do this logically and then I will show you how our calculation actually corresponds to this definition and this formula. To calculate the average price that you paid, what you need to do is figure out the total amount that you paid and then divide that by the total number of stocks that you purchased. You made a purchase of $2,000 worth of stock every month for three months so overall you purchased six thousand worth of stocks which is essentially two thousand multiplied by three then if you look at how many stocks you bought in the first month you bought two thousand divided by 20 because that was the share price initially and then in the second month you bought two thousand divided by 24 and in the third month you bought 2000 divided by 30 when you solve this you should get the average price that you paid for stocks the answer you should get is 24 and that is the harmonic mean now let's look at the formula xh stands for the harmonic mean this is given by n which is the number of items which is 3 in this case divided by the summation of 1 over x x being each of the items of which you are finding the harmonic mean in our example that's 20 24 and 30 so the first 1 over x would be 1 over 20 and then we have 1 over 24 and then 1 over 30 so that is the formula if you look at what you've done over here and apply some basic algebra you can divide the numerator and denominator by 2000 and you will still have the same fraction if you divide the numerator by 2000 this cancels out 
if you divide the denominator by 2000 then we essentially have these 2000s cancelling out and we are just left with one notice now that what you have here is exactly the same as the formula for the harmonic mean so once you are convinced that this works you don't need to go through this relatively long-winded exercise you can simply plug in n which is the number of items of which you are finding the harmonic mean and then 1 over 20 where 20 is the first item and so on this should give you 24 now this definition might make sense where we say that the harmonic mean is a special type of weighted mean in which an observation's weight is inversely proportional to its magnitude so what this is trying to say is expressed over here i would not get too hung up on this definition the more important point is to recognize the use of the harmonic mean which is given over here when you are spending an equal amount of money on stocks where the stock price is changing and you want to compute the average price that you are paying then you have to compute the harmonic mean so here is a practice question that will help reinforce this concept you should be able to do it quite fast and the answer is on average you pay twelve dollars per stock let us now look at a comparison of the arithmetic mean, geometric mean and harmonic mean. If returns are constant over time, then the three will be the same. So if you have three years and in all three years the return is 7%, then clearly the arithmetic mean is 7%. The geometric mean will be 1.07 into 1.07 into 1.07 raised to the power of 1 over 3 and then minus 1 that will also give you 7% and if you do the harmonic mean calculation you will get 7% if returns are variable then the arithmetic mean will be greater than the geometric mean which is greater than the harmonic mean let's say our returns over the three years are 7% 8% and 9% the arithmetic mean is clearly 8% if you compute the geometric mean it is going to be less than eight percent and the harmonic mean is going to be even less than that the difference between the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean becomes more if the variability increases in other words if the returns are then five percent eight percent and eleven percent the difference between the arithmetic mean is actually going to increase from here to here and you should do this at least once in your lifetime to convince yourself that this is indeed true and then you should be able to answer the sorts of questions that might show up on this subject moving now to other measures of location say you have the following return data for 20 mutual funds and the data has been organized for you in ascending order so we have fund number one two three all the way to fund number 20 and we are given the return data we can divide this data into quartiles which means that the data is divided into quarters if you have a total of 20 funds then dividing into quarters means that in each bucket you have 20 divided by 4 which is equal to 5 funds so this would be one quartile this would be a second quartile the third quartile and the fourth quartile dividing into quintiles means that we divide into five different buckets so 20 over 5 is equal to 4 so here we would have one two three and four this would be one quintile five through eight would be another quintile and so on dividing into deciles means dividing into tenths so with 20 numbers dividing into tenths would mean two and then three and four five and six and so on and finally percentile means that the distribution is divided into hundreds of percents 
let us now understand the concept of location again using the same data at a given percentile y with n data points in our example n is 20 and the data is sorted in ascending order the location of a given observation is as follows the location of y let's say location of 10 this 10 is referring to the 10th percentile so the 10th percentile is 20 plus 1 where is the 20 coming from 20 is the number of data points plus 1 is simply part of the formula into y which is the percentile essentially we are coming up with the location of the 10th percentile so the assumption is that the data has been sorted in ascending order so y is the percentile and 100 is part of the formula so we get 2.1 this is saying that the location of the 10th percentile is 2.1 this is the formula given to you in the curriculum and this is the formula used in standard statistics textbooks so you need to learn the formula and learn how to use it but recognize the fact that if your sample sizes are small recognize the fact that if your sample size is small then this formula gives you a approximation it becomes more precise as the sample size increases and the way you can see that is for the 10th percentile our location should simply be 2 but because of this plus 1 we get the 2.1 which means that our answer is an uh, approximation. This works when we have larger data sets, but on your exam, if you get a question related to location, then you should use this formula. Let us now work through a practice question. Consider this data set and using the formula that we just talked about, you need to find the 75th percentile the first quartile and the fifth decile. Recognize that the first quartile is the same as the 25th percentile and the fifth decile is the same as the 50th percentile. Here is what you need to do. First, arrange the data in ascending order. So this is what you will come up with. Then, for the 75th percentile, we need to come up with the location, which is given by the formula that you should have learnt by now. The location of the 75th percentile is n, that's the number of items in our data set, plus 1, which is part of the formula. Multiply by 75th percentile over 100. So this tells us that the location of the 75th percentile is 9. And then you look at the 9th value, which is right here. So, the value denoted by P, so P75 is 40. L tells us the location, which is 9, and P, or the 75th percentile, the actual value is 40. So, simplistically, we say that 75% of the data is over here. And this would be approximately 75% because we have a small data size. next location of the first quartile so location of the first quartile that is the 25th percentile that is given by again n plus 1 and then the percentile divided by 100 this gives us 3 that's the location and then when you look at the third item that is 34 and similarly you can come up with the location of the fifth decile and then P50 is 36. Now let's understand the concept of linear interpolation. Linear interpolation is used when the location is not a whole number or not an integer. And in other words, the location then lies between the two closest numbers. Say we want to find the sixth decile and using our formula, we come up with 
7.2 this is the location number for the 60th percentile which is the same as the 6th decile now we don't have a whole number here so we must use linear interpolation which estimates an unknown value on the basis of two known values that surround it in the above case the seventh value is 37 that's right here the eighth value is 39 and we are actually concerned with location 7.2 so the way you can look at this is as follows so we have the seventh value which is 37 the eighth value which is 39 so we need to come to point 7.2 so that is going to be 20 percent of your way between here and here so about 20 percent of 2 that is equal to 0.4 so this number here is 37.4 that is the number that we have for P60, 37.4.